everybody. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening from everywhere in the world where you're joining us. I'm Audrey Fontaine. I am a global health passionate and I'm a fellow of the uh, Institute of Open Diplomacy. I will be the moderator for today's discussion on One Health going beyond research and taking action to avoid crisis. So I'm thrilled today to be joined by fantastic speakers. Um, so we have here with us uh, Ms. Irina Bokova, who is a former director general of UNESCO. We also have online Dr. Naoko Yamamoto, who is the assistant uh, director general of WHO, the World Health Organization. We also have Dr. Muhammad Ali Patti, who is professor at Harvard University and the former director for health, nutrition and population at the World Bank. Um, we have Melanie Marel, founder and director general of So Science and Ashoka Fellow. And we also have Elise Rodriguez, the head of global advocacy at Global Health Advocate France. So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining us. Um, thank you, dear speakers, to take, for taking time in your busy schedule to talk about this critical subject of One Health. Um, before we jump into the, the, the subject, maybe some housekeeping rules. Uh, so we will have a first roundtable discussion, followed by some question and answers. So you are welcome to send your questions in so that we can uh, address them in the second part. Um, so let's start with the discussion right now. Um, so with the current COVID crisis, we've seen a disease starting in the animal, moving to human being, and it actually sheds a light on the fact that there is an interconnection between animal health, human health, and environmental health. And I will start by turning to Dr. Yamamoto uh, from WHO so that you can tell us what is um, your environmental health and why is it important to focus on the relationship between people and the environment? Dr. Yamamoto, your turn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful discussion. And thank you for this question. Let me start by saying that environmental health is a fundamental element for development, peace, and people's well being. In fact, healthier environment could prevent almost one quarter of the global burden of disease. Clean air and stable climate, adequate water sanitation, hygiene, safe use of chemicals, healthy and safe workplace, as well as preserved nature, are all conditions for good for its all conditions for good health. As far as in 1989, WHO established that environmental health refers to those aspects of the human health and disease that are determined by factors in the environment. The relationship between human, animal, and planet is critical for the environment health. In recent years, the number of the high threat zoonotic diseases or vector-borne diseases or pathogens has increased. Our eco ecosystems are under significant stress due to human activity, including, for example, population growth, movement, change the land use and sea use, overall exploitation of the resources and loss of the biodiversity or climate change and the pollution, so on. These changes have created new opportunity for diseases to emerge and spread. Therefore, the unlikely interaction at the human-animal environment interface have increased due to the factors I just mentioned, but also the to other such as large-scale deforestation and extraction, and also overuse and misuse of antibiotics and mis unsustainable food system. All these factors combined with the range of the socioeconomic factors and uh, persistence inequalities. As you can see, the health of human, animal, and planet ecosystem are closely interlinked. That is why changes in this balance are catalyst and threat to the exacerbated the global burden of infectious and non communicable diseases. The COVID-19 pandemic is a reminder of this delicate interrelationship and relationship. Therefore, recognize this interdependence all relevant sectors and disciplines across human animal environment interface need to be involved to address human health in a way that is more effectively efficient and sustainable for search for solution. This is exactly one health approach, and this is why we need to discuss human-animal planet health. 
Let me stop here. Thank you for asking. Thank you very much, Dr. Danamoto. Um, actually, jumping on what you said with the ecosystem being at risk and the new opportunities for disease to develop, I'm going to turn to Dr. Pate to ask you, how does the environmental health promote, I mean, how can environmental health promote human health and the well-being of humans um, and foster healthy and safe communities? Danamoto laid out sort of the interconnectedness now, the biological factors that affect human health operate and interact with humans within the context of that environment. And these interactions in the environment occur at two broad levels, at the individual level and at the population level. At the individual level, the exposure to environmental factors such as pollutants, microbial agents, lifestyle and behaviors contribute to the development of serious chronic diseases causing considerable burden to individuals, families, and societies. These individual exposures are both internal to the individual as well as can be external. For example, the internal byproducts of metabolism that can be toxic themselves cause disease or external such as heavy metal pollutants in the environment. The exposures are also long-term. In fact, following the whole of life course approach from conception to childhood and to adulthood and causing disease along the way. Cumulatively, such exposures contribute to the rising non-communicable diseases with their significant impact. For example, chronic non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, asthma, and cancers exert huge tolls in human suffering as well as in cost to health systems and economies. Non-communicable diseases account for more than half of the global burden of disease and disability. And they cost significant amounts of resources for almost all countries. And the environmental factors here are included, uh, such as the pollutants that I mentioned, the lifestyle behaviors are the main causes of the chronic non-communicable diseases that are dominating currently worldwide mortality and mobility. Therefore, environmental health can promote human health and well-being by minimizing the exposure of individuals to environmental factors that I have mentioned, which adversely affect the human health, causing disease, death, and suffering. At the population level, changes in the human environment and ecology can enable disease-causing agents to thrive and affect the health of large swaths of populations. I think Dr. Yamamoto alluded to this as well. Encroachment of human populations into forests increases the likelihood of encountering new disease agents that can cause widespread human disease, like a pandemic. For example, the climate change uh, due to global warming, vectors can emerge in newer areas and transmit diseases such as dengue, malaria, and other vector-borne diseases in areas they had not done before. Flooding makes it easier for water sources to be polluted with enteric organisms, for example, causing typhoid, or cholera outbreaks. Humanitarian crises due to environmental damage may also displace populations, causing significant physical and mental stress, affecting health of large populations. We're going through a pandemic right now. And I think that's also, in a way, uh, diseases like that can emerge as we interact widely with the uh, uh, natural environment. Therefore, proper environmental stewardship Dealing with climate change by reducing greenhouse gases potentially reduces the likelihood of scenarios of worsening human misery due to the displacement that can be caused by environmental disasters. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patti. Um, we are going to discuss a little bit further um, at the end of this uh, roundtable about the consequences and how we can uh, tackle them. Um, but maybe before we go a little bit deeper into this topic, I would like to take a step further um, and see the consequences of this health crisis, of the interaction between um, human health, animal health, environmental health on the global level, and what we could see during this COVID crisis is that there is huge inequity in the world. We've seen with the vaccine inequity, for instance, when some parts of the world 
are vaccinated with more than 70% of their population. Some other places like low and middle income countries still have some issues vaccinating people. They have only 1% of the population vaccinated. Um, so health inequities are very strong. They go beyond vaccines and they go also beyond health. Um, so in this part, I'm gonna turn to Elise Rodriguez. Um, at Global Health Advocate, you are fighting daily against uh, inequities in health and beyond. And could you tell us, based on your practice, how COVID-19 has revealed health inequities and other geopolitical issues? This, uh, this panel and the dis discussion today. Well, um, I, I will start by saying that uh, um, what the COVID-19 has revealed is that at first we, were, we weren't ready for combating a pandemic uh, first. And the second is that the, the, the system uh, that we, we live in isn't fit, fit for purpose. Uh, isn't fit for the for, for the purpose for such global challenge as a pandemic. So it raises the question of uh, the world capacity to cope with global threats in a meaningful meaningful way. Um, yeah, you, you you say it. You said it. The system we live in generated more inequalities, which results in a world divided into two camps, unfortunately. So those who have access to vaccines and can produce the tools, and those who don't have access uh, to vaccines and their right to develop these tools and other goods on, on their own. And since the beginning of the pandemic, the need to ensure global open access and the right to produce and supply COVID-19 technologies has been widely acknowledged. We've seen countless statements by leaders and governments repeating this motto, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And we've been hearing calls for making the vaccine a global public good. Uh, and indeed, you know, the fastest way to end the pandemic is to make safe and effective vaccine available to everyone on the planet. But it's not, you know, overstating to say that the global response kind of failed. And it is now um, more based on economic and geopolitics consideration than led by a true public health imperative. Um, when the outbreak occurred, we believed that you know, the main barrier to beating the disease was science. And then uh, when less than a year after the, the, the genetic code of the virus has been discovered, and the world community managed to develop a range of effective technologies like vaccines. So this is a huge success, but it was quite, you know, immediately tainted by the inability uh, to, to allow everyone to access to these life-saving tools. And um, first we've seen um, behavior uh, from countries and nations will, uh, that, that, that can also, you know, uh, yeah, inform the way we need uh, to, 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 to think and to rethink the way we are organized and we live in the same, and we will build the future of governance to achieving, you know, uh, uh, the response to all these global challenges. Um, we've seen, yeah, COVID-19 holding by wealthy countries, which countries um, uh, with 40% or 30% of the world population have secured 63% of the best vaccines and drying up the global supply one year uh, ago. Um, some countries have purchased enough jab for five complete immunization per citizens when uh, we know that uh, others um, are still waiting for their first uh, jab. And to avoid this uh, unfair access, this situation, um, a multilateral mechanism has been put in place to accelerate the, the development and this equitable distribution of vaccines. So, you know, the, 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 the need for, for this, uh, this uh, global cooperation has been, you know, recognized. But this mechanism face, uh, faced and faces uh, a lot of challenges, like a, lot, uh, a lack of uh, financing, and also manufacturers who prioritize bilateral deals and many high income countries tying up this global supply of vaccines. Um, which, and we ended, we, we ended up with the situation you just, uh, you just mentioned, uh, Audrey, uh, with a, a huge division between uh, uh, low and middle income countries and, uh, and which nations in terms of vaccination rates. And the current slow speed uh, in delivery for vaccines program 
um, being rolled out globally shows why it is important that richer nations support countries who are less able to get their hands on as many vaccines. And, you know, the science, the technology and the know-how behind vaccines is currently protected by patents and by intellectual uh, property rules. And this allows pharmaceutical companies to block other manufacturers around the world from making vaccines. So the current system put all the power in the hands of companies to make secret deals to the highest bidder. This current system means that private interests prevailed um, and, pre and are prevailing on health needs. And, um, and in this case, health is considered, considered as, as a commodity, not a right. So I would say that the pandemic has really played a role in revealing this, the limits of international cooperation in responding to challenges that are by definition global. And um, when you see how rich nations like the US, uh, the European Union, the UK are actively blocking the proposals submitted by others uh, in the World Trade Organization to waive the patents and ramp up vaccine production, you understand it as a, as a fact that leaders, these leaders are actually, you know, defending rules that prevent the world from meeting the health needs of, of everyone and from, uh, from, from the others. And regional and international trade agreements lay down obligations that run against these global, global health goals. So the question is, how can we deal with this limitation? And are we ready to change the way we think global governance to effectively achieve these you know, um, global challenges? Um, thank you, Elise. So definitely when we talk about global challenges, I will go beyond uh, health. Um, we've seen that the COVID-19 has reorganized priorities, has put some activities on hold, um, thinking maybe on education, some cultural activities. So I will turn to uh, Ms. Bokova, who I said earlier was a former director general of UNESCO, but she's also board member of uh, Open Diplomacy. I forgot this one, it was really important. Um, so turning back to you, um, based on your experience, could you develop a little bit on the links between health and broader, broader sorry, ge geopolitical aspects, please? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Audrey, and thank you for uh, uh, having this opportunity to participate in this important debate with uh, experts and, uh, and global advocates like, like yourself. Um, I could pick up on uh, what uh, Elise just said about the global governance and about the importance of uh, having uh, a strong and coordinated approach uh, because the uh, COVID-19 pandemic indeed uh, was uh, probably the biggest uh, and most abrupt uh, challenge uh, to the global system, uh, but also brought now uh, a profound change. And I would say that uh, nothing uh, uh, is before uh, in, in any of the uh, areas of the sustainable development agenda, uh, be it uh, the climate, uh, the link between uh, uh, health and education and well-being uh, and jobs um, and everything. Um, I would like to touch upon the three things. Uh, the first, uh, you did mention about inequalities. Uh, the second, uh, I would like to speak a little bit about the digital response and what the digital plays nowadays, uh, both in health, in education, but in any other area, and how we should make it an inclusive uh, tool. Uh, for achieving uh, that no, no one is left behind, uh, which is the underlying reasoning of the Agenda 2030 for sustainable development, and last but not least, uh, the role of science. Now, uh, when I speak about inequalities, uh, we have seen that uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was like a, a, a screenshot of all the deficiencies of the systems, of the health systems, of the education systems, uh, of uh, social systems uh, uh, in different countries. Uh, and uh, now we are uh, in a situation where uh, inequalities are growing immensely. Uh, and uh, the example with education is a very clear uh, in my view, uh, uh, point, uh, because not only 90% of the schools were closed um, and uh, uh, millions of children were out of school. Some of them will never go back, uh, uh, but also uh, because 
uh, schooling uh, is um, a place for many of these children to get a meal uh, or to uh, get some more skills uh, that are very much needed. And now when they're not having this opportunity, they're going back to poverty. Uh, and uh, uh, the same holds true, uh, I think, uh, also in the digital area, uh, because we all thought that the response, of course, is uh, we all go online, and this is the way uh, we will provide uh, education, or for that matter, also health and some other services. And indeed, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to do this. But at the same time, uh, we should know that the digital divide uh, in the world is huge uh, because half of the world's population do not have access to internet. Uh, and even those who have access to internet, they have an equal access to internet uh, because of its quality, uh, because of the lack of uh, skills to, uh, to uh, get access and to use it. And uh, this we have seen, when, uh, seen in the developed countries and uh, very many of the OECD countries, uh, which may be it's surprising, but this is the reality. Uh, and unless we really uh, look at uh, bridging this uh, digital divide, and by the way, the digi digital divide is opening, and this is the trend that we are seeing. Um, uh, sometimes we are speaking about gender digital divide, which also is uh, uh, growing, and uh, girls are uh, much more uh, into the situation where they do not have access to such, uh, such facilities, uh, not to speak about teachers that have to be trained in order to be there, and the multiple, I would say, of, of problems uh, that uh, this, uh, this puts ahead. Um, according to some, and I would say, conservative estimates that were published by UNESCO recently in a report, the point that uh, because of this crisis, um, there will be 10 trillion loss uh, of uh, the future earnings of children that uh, did not have access or they now they do not have the same access to uh, education and this is really something which is uh, uh, very very disturbing um, and um, uh, speaking about the digital I would say uh, that um, uh, uh, the digital uh, should be looked uh, also from the point of view of social inclusion I think this is very important uh, this is where we have to look at its uh, how multilingualism is uh, how the local context content is there when we speak about education and how, of course, in health system it is used uh, once again uh, for that matter. And last but not least, I think it's important to mention and also to pick up from uh, what Elise said, it's about science. Uh, and we have seen the, uh, I would say, the incredible uh, advances of science and uh, the fact that in the second year now we have the vaccines and also uh, a lot of acceleration uh, in the area fighting other diseases uh, as well, which is very important uh, to mention here. Um, but at the same time, uh, we have seen a lot of, uh, I would say, resistance also to science. Uh, uh, and uh, um, um, I was just reading this um, uh, last day, the new report of the Secretary General, uh, Antonio Gutierrez of the United Nations, uh, of the State of the United Nations, of his uh, proposals, uh, recommendations uh, for the future, and he uh, came with the idea, an idea that existed before, but now he wants to strengthening, uh, and I think it's very important, uh, uh, about uh, how science, science policy interface uh, should be once again brought into the political agenda. Because it is not only enough to say, yes, there are advances in sciences, but they have to be <coughs> taken on board, uh, I think, by politicians, by political leaders, others. Uh, and. Um, I know that the International Science Council uh, right, right now is uh, uh, working uh, very strongly, this is the biggest uh, scientific organization of the world, uh, is looking at how scientists indeed can contribute and how science can be recognized as giving one of the solutions for these problems. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Well, you actually helped me with the transition to the second part uh, of this uh, discussion, because we've talked about the state of heart and how human animal and environmental health are connected, what are the issues on the geopolitical level, um, and science has actually shown us that 60% of the current infectious diseases are zoonotic. Um, so I'm going to turn to Elise Rodriguez again um, to ask her, is this risk of zoonosis, um, is it a new word to kind of scare people away, or are we, or is it a new way to name the cataclysm that we can expect in the future? 
Well, I'll take the late, the latter options. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's a fact backed by, by scientific uh, research, and as you said, yeah, 60% uh, of known infectious disease and 17%, 75% of emerging pathogens that infect humans are zoonotic, which means um, that they originate in animals. Um, but uh, perhaps we should go a step further by questioning the reason why we see more transmission of disease from wildlife to human. And, and this is more um, a highly yeah, political question in the sense that it brings the, 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 the question on um, the way we as human behave to pursue our own economic uh, development. And I mean, these threats are man-made. Um, among top causes of transmissions of zoonotic um, disease like the COVID-19, you have wild animal traffic, biodiversity loss, and intensive animal farming. Um, and with the level of the challenge, avoiding zoonotic outbreaks in the future will necessitate a complete change in the intensity of human managed ecosystems with decreased deforestations and spaces extensions including, of course, a reversal of world's climate tipping points. And um, I mean, the way we behave, the way we think about our own development has uh, an effect on, on the planet, as it has been said already. We, um, as human, uh, we are dramatically affecting our global food production system, the, the quality of the air we, we breathe and, and the water we drink. And of course, we are facing this exposure to infectious, infectious disease. Um, so changes to, to natural life support um, systems are already impacting our health and are projected to drive the majority of the global burden of disease over the coming century. And uh, I, I like I read an article from another, and the author was questioning whether this may be, you know, the nature's wake-up call in this uh, in this situation and of course we need to move forward with this concept that i very much support which is the one health approach uh, with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes by recognizing the internal connections between people animals plants and their shared environment but i believe that we need maybe to 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 yeah to 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 of course increase this uh, need for integration between these uh, different sectors, but we need also more leadership to uh, also recognize uh, our, uh, how much, you know, the way we will choose, uh, the way we will develop, we will do the development, we will uh, uh, fix our objective in terms of, yeah, human development will have also uh, uh, a big uh, impact on uh, this planetary health concept. Um, thank you very much, Elise. Um, so yeah, definitely you talked about biodiversity, intensive farming, um, and I will jump on these two words uh, and go back to Dr. Patty. You, you, you talked also earlier about the, the long-term uh, impact on the crisis, and we could have seen uh, during the COVID crisis that the um, situation, the health situation, has also worsened the situation uh, as regards to food security uh, in the poorest and the most vulnerable country. Um, so, Dr. Patty, you were the former director for health, nutrition and population at the World Bank. Um, so could you please explain to us a little bit the link between zoonotic risk, um, nutrition and health? I, I think, um, Elsie, the, the gave eloquently sort of the the backdrop and in terms of the origin of zoonotic diseases and we're living through one the COVID-19 pandemic itself we've seen how it has affected hundreds of millions of people and killed millions more but it also caused significant economic devastation and uh, we've seen that in economies both the rich and the less rich or the poorest parts of the world uh, the pandemic is pushing more than 100 million people into extreme poverty. That's an outcome of a zoonotic disease. It disrupted the economies at its peak, destroying lives and livelihoods, both on the supply side, but also on the demand side of the economies. We know the lockdowns and all the adverse impact. And it's also disproportionately affecting those who are most vulnerable and the poorest uh, countries who will bear the brunt of this uh, change. Uh, women, adolescents, uh, girls and children, in addition to what was mentioned also in terms of what it means for education. 
inevitably, as people become poorer, their food security gets affected. And what you should be expecting, in fact, it's already happening in some parts of uh, the, the the world where I could question, for instance, and, and stunting over time among children uh, would be the inevitable outcome of what started as a zoonotic uh, 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 disease uh, outbreak that became a pandemic that ruined, in a way, uh, the economy of the world and with huge impact on the human capital accumulation for most of those uh, children because they've been disrupted from attending school, they haven't had the food, their families have become uh, worse off in terms of uh, poverty. And it's not just about COVID, uh, Elsie alluded to it. I think over the last 20, 30 years, we've seen the increasing spread of zoonotic diseases crossing into human populations for the exact behaviors that we, we humans have sort of manifested in terms of dealing with the environment and the ecology within which we exist. From Nipah virus in the late 90s uh, to the SARS-CoV-2 in 2003 uh, to the MERS coronavirus, these are all zoonotic diseases. Uh, Ebola is likely one of them, as well as the one that we are currently in, uh, involved with. So at the end of the day, uh, I think it's really about this uh, threat to human society as a consequence of failure to manage this balance between humans, uh, the pathogens or other biological uh, species that are existing in this earth that we have, and also our environment that inevitably uh, becomes self-defeating in terms of really the, um, the, the health and well-being of, of the world. Additionally, things like antimicrobial resistance, uh, where the link between human health and animal health is very close, where misuse of antibiotics in uh, production of livestock, aquaculture, or among human uh, populations in terms of human health lead to emergence of antimicrobial resistance, which by itself causes undue burden in economic costs, lives uh, uh, of, of populations, and that also adversely affects the economies of households that could contribute in the long run uh, to some of those uh, issues of uh, poverty and in, in, in insecurity. I think we need to look at it holistically, and I think the concept of One Health is our opportunity, given the experience of COVID-19, to look at how do we look at our position in this world in an integrated manner and manage it as such. Otherwise, I think it would be a very turbulent period ahead for all of us. All right, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, we need this uh, integrated approach and we will touch on it uh, very soon. But first, I do have a question to Melanie Marcel, uh, who is a founder and director general of Soul Science. Um, so we've talked a little bit already about the consequences and the risk of, I mean, the consequences of zoonotic uh, outbreaks. We talk about poverty, digital gap, gender gap, education, threats of biodiversity. Um, maybe, Melanie, can you elaborate a little bit more on how we could measure the risk of zoonotic outbreaks and their impacts and where does the, gender, the danger comes from? Comes from sorry. <laughs> um, I think you're muted, Melanie. Melanie, I think you're muted. Okay, sure. So by the time we uh, try to connect again uh, with Melanie, um, I suggest we can move on to uh, like more practice, like from this state of art, the causes and the subject, we can go to newer approaches and practices. Um, so we've talked about One Health a little bit already. Um, this interconnection between animal health, human health, environmental health. And I will turn to Dr. Yamamoto um, to ask you, so from the WHO side, um, how did the integrated One Health approach arise? And what does it consist of? And what is the role that WHO play in, promoted, uh, in promoting sorry, an integrated approach to prevent future pandemics and which deliverables could be expected? Thank you, Audrey. Thank you very much for asking that question. We have already discussed about the uh, risks of the uh, uh, issues, right? Emerging, re emerging diseases like SARS, MERS, Ebola, COVID 19 may, uh, made us recognize that we cannot protect human health without addressing multi sectoral system approach with coordination on the links between human, animal, and ecosystem health. It's clear. But uh, 
would like to say that uh, you also we need to mention that we have already discussed a little bit about MR and neglect of tropical diseases. But uh, WHO thinks that One Health is not only about the health risks at the human and environment interface, but also an opportunity for health promotion. For example, like urban health setting, uh, you know, do, do urban health settings not, do not only present potential threat, but also potential opportunities, people's engagement with natural environment and to healthy lifestyle by investing in environment and urban planning. That is why we are going to integrate One Health into the global health narratives. And regarding the uh, deliberation or a deliberable so our expectation, I would like to highlight two issues. One is, first, development of the comprehensive risk assessment framework and the global monitoring system. So in the partnership with FAO, OIE, UNEP, and other stakeholders, we are going to, and we are working together to discuss the need for the comprehensive framework for reviewing the various drivers of emerge emergence and this framework will drive the development of the integrated data system that leverages the existing surveillance and data sources from various UN agency and technical partners. And likewise, integrated data system is crucial for early warning and the future research. Another line of work is strengthening the capacity of the countries. We are working for the intersectoral arrangements and mechanisms to facilitate partnership, collaboration, and cooperation, policy coherence in development of multi-stakeholder driven solution. Also, we are working with the instrument of the community engagement, social mobilization, capacity development to design major to reduce risks and promote health. So regarding the role of the WHO, there are various roles and all linked together. First key role is promoting One Health approach in the global narrative and the political dialogue and advocacy. We have also conducted mapping and analyzing existing policy and regulations. Another important role of WHO is develop a new strategy, guidance, and policy brief in partnership with FAOI, UNEP, and other partners. Likewise, we work to provide the technical support countries. And this, last but not least, we have to collect, collect and disseminate data and evidence as well as promotion research in this area. And let me stop here. Thank you for asking. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yamamoto. And I'm told that we are we have uh, Melanie back. Um, so maybe I suggest that we will uh, pick up a little bit of the previous question in the one that I'm going to ask you right now, Melanie, if that's fine with you. Um, so Dr. Yamamoto uh, talked about the importance to promote the one else approach uh, in the narrative, um, but also in action. So maybe turning to you, because you, you are a field expert, um, how can we take action uh, on one health? Um, what can be done to promote this uh, integrated and sustainable approach? And maybe if you can, can, in this answer, touch a little bit upon the previous point uh, on zoonotic risk and because it's kind of linked, so the impact, where does the danger come from and what can we do um, at the action level? Over to you, Melanie. Thank you very much. I hope it works now. Um, so thank you for having me in this conversation. And indeed, um, I think it's important to think about uh, and understand a bit better the scientific aspect of the zoonotic transmission in order to understand the risk and where does the danger come from. Um, the very traditional or let's say classic way today to know uh, if there is a risk of uh, a zoonose in a certain region is to actually use what we call sentinel, which are animals uh, that will carry the virus um, and if they have a certain prevalence uh, of the virus in this population of animals, we know that there is a high probability that it can jump or what we say spill over to humans. Uh, so that's uh, how we can manage or at least try to uh, know in a specific context, in a specific region, if there is a risk for a zoonose. 
Um, the problem with this method is that first, it's very, very context specific, depends on the virus, depends on the Sentinel that you are using. Um, and the second thing is that very often when you have your risk assessment, it can be too late. Um, for example, we can see that uh, with the, the COVID situation, um, we had a very high knowledge of how the, the, the virus uh, SARS-CoV was actually evolving uh, over the past few years. But from the moment it spilled over to human population, uh, it, it was extremely fast. Um, and we were not equipped to actually stop the pandemic uh, fast enough. So nowadays, scientists are trying to change a bit the model and they're trying to uh, go towards what we call uh, the dilution effect. So there is a, a bunch of scientific research and scientific papers showing that you can actually link the risk of zoonoses with um, the, let's say, the quality of the biodiversity of certain environments. And the reason is that some species will actually not carry the virus or will actually act as a buffer for some certain viruses. And so if you have a high biodiversity environment, uh, you have higher chances of actually uh, manage uh, the, the, the risk of spillover to human population. So that's something that is extremely interesting uh, that could help us manage this kind of risk um, with, with a bit more um, advance, let's say, on the viruses. Uh, and it's currently research for, there is a very interesting um, uh, research currently done by the French uh, Research Institute for Sustainable Development that is uh, ongoing on this specific question. So we are seeing, uh, again, science evolving and trying to develop tools uh, that are more efficient uh, in order to help uh, public policies and to help manage the risk. Um, on the danger part, I think it's extremely important. So a lot of things were already said on the fact that the biodiversity loss, of course, is a problem, uh, that our development uh, model uh, is today a problem with high rates of urbanization uh, that create this kind of contacts between human uh, and wildlife, uh, and that increases, again, the, the risk of, of spillovers. Um, but I will not go back on that because it was all already discussed. What I would like to insist a bit more on is actually what uh, Irina mentioned uh, about the importance of science and how um, a, a, an idea that science could be rejected, for example, would be a high danger in this kind of, uh, of situation and, uh, and in actually fighting against zoonos. And so I can do the link between this question and what could be some sort of solutions. Um, the fact is that today scientific facts uh, can help us a lot tremendously and it has done so in the COVID uh, crisis, for example. We have a better understanding uh, of what's going on thanks to, to all the data that we, we have, but we also are able to create solution and the vaccine is one of those creation uh, that, that science really helps us um, emerge actually. But the main problem today is that there is a, a general feeling that science is not inclusive enough, and that's why it's somehow sometimes rejected. Um, and so what we advocate for at SoScience is to actually create an inclusive science where all over the process, so really from asking the research question to the valorization of the solution, you include the civil society and you include people from the field, people from the ground that have an understanding of the local context. Uh, so it's a very inclusive way of doing science, but it's extremely new in its approach to um, the link between science and society. And it goes way beyond what we usually call citizen science, uh, because it's not just about using the knowledge of the citizens, but it's about having them as part of the whole process from the research question to the valorization. 
this kind of approach are extremely new and there are going to be implemented uh, in the following years at the European uh, level. But it would be extremely interesting to see how we can rethink and reframe our way of doing science so it can actually include the civil society and create a, a more framework of, of actually trust uh, into the scientific results. So that would be really one of the main danger, but also solution uh, to these kind of problems that are global uh, and that have major uh, Im impacts on the society as a whole. So the society needs to be part of, of the science. All right, thank you very much, Melanie. So you, you talked to us a little bit about how citizens can be involved uh, in research, how we can get this integrated approach, not only human, animal, environmental, but also with citizens. Um, and maybe now turning to Elise, who is also a field actor. Um, can you tell us a little bit how we can, how can, we can do this approach? Because uh, Melanie was talking about the uh, going from research beyond research to avoid crisis, which is actually the theme of our, um, our table, round table today. So what do you do on the, on the field uh, to help promoting the One Health approach? Well, um, well, my organization is kind of specialized on trying to influence, you know, policies, national and international policies to help uh, getting the right decision in place to uh, overcome the challenge that we just, you know, talked about. And maybe I just wanted to share some of um, some, some, yeah, some remarks on the key ingredients that, you know, uh, could be taken into account while promoting the One Health approach. Um, maybe the first um, is to say that, you know, um, there is a question of um, how much, you know, the, the, the One Health approach um, is um, equipped uh, to be uh, uh, to be uh, appropriately operationalized, meaning uh, uh, supported and really backed by uh, decision makers. And you know, it's about understanding and acting upon these challenges. That and it calls for you know a collaboration across disciplinary and uh, national uh, boundaries to safeguard uh, our health. But it's about also um, making sure that you will have a true leadership behind, uh, behind it. And I feel like the One Health approach has uh, kind of uh, two major um, limitations from a decision maker point of view, if I'm being a bit provocative. First, um, you know, you need leadership because you need to bring different sector, different people, experts together. And, you know, applying this multi, multi sectoral approach is uh, obviously, you know, what we need to do, but it's quite difficult to implement when you see how siloed policies are and uh, even budget lines are, are also very, uh, very concretely, you know, uh, fragmented, I would say. So there is um, an issue in terms of what would be, you know, uh, the implementation of the One Health approach concretely. Um, and when we talk about this operationalization, um, we talk about prevention, and this is the second limitation, if I would say, uh, that we need to overcome, of course, is um, we know um, that prevention is uh, more, the most cost effective, you know, uh, that, that the response, but this requires uh, to invest uh, in the long run, right? So it means beyond the results of an election. So again, for politicians, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that, that is difficult to, uh, to envision, I would say. Um, and maybe to add on two points, um, I think also that uh, referring to the One Health approach, we were also mentioning different uh, other different concepts that are kind of linked or related to the One Health approach uh, with the, the planetary health, the pandemic preparedness. And I felt like we need also to make sure that we will avoid a kind of competition between different narratives. Uh, first of all, because people are getting a bit lost with uh, with uh, with all these uh, these narratives, and and the global you know community kind of like uh, developing new narratives, but sometimes 
uh, maybe it's uh, it's easier it's 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 uh, it's it's easy to create a new narrative when concretely we need implementation and we need to take uh, uh, courageous measures um, and maybe um, a last point um, is that um, uh, I think we we if we want to move forward as you know a global uh, uh, community, we must also ensure that this existing multilateral cooperation um, is strengthened and is able to, to deliver. And uh, for this process to be efficient, we think that, you know, actors uh, and stakeholders that are uh, responsible for the management of this One Health approach, um, including global health security and pandemic response, and including the private sector, which has a role to play, um, uh, obviously, should be kind of tied to a shared accountability model. Uh, we need to have um, the same goal and make sure that, you know, um, uh, all the stakeholders kind of, you know, comply with this common goal, uh, because we are facing a lot of kind of incoherence, uh, policy incoherence uh, currently happening with the example of the COVID-19 crisis, but we have so many examples of this policy incoherence that prevents us from being truly, you know, um, um, all together uh, for managing such a, such a big risk. All right, thank you very much, Elise. Um, so I take from what you just say that we need to invest uh, on prevention. We need to work together in a multilateral and multi-stakeholder approach uh, for health issues and maybe going beyond health a little bit. And I will now turn to Ms. Um, Bokova again. Um, how can we strengthen this um, One Health approach and also broader than One Health, this multilateral approach to ensure we go towards a more sustainable world? I believe sure. this is... I believe this is indeed a fundamental question uh, because uh, many of the speakers uh, just mentioned that um, the crisis nowadays that we are confronting uh, uh, has a totally new dimension and uh, the response has been fragmented and does not correspond to what the necessity is. Um, we can speak long, of course, uh, about the reasons, we can speak about the shifting geopolitics, we can uh, speak about undermining the United Nations and multilateral system from all different uh, actors, but uh, for me, and it uh, resonates deeply with my experience at UNESCO and uh, also uh, at working uh, for the achievement of the adoption of the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda in 2015 and also the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, and I can say that um, definitely there is a lot of room for reform, a lot of room for uh, uh, doing things better, but I don't see any other uh, similar multilateral platform than the United Nations where these issues uh, not only can be discussed, but also find the right, uh, right answer. Uh, because the United Nations uh, is universal, because it is normative setting, um, because it's this uh, bigger platform for accountability, and I think Elise also spoke about that. Um, uh, and uh, there are many, uh, many good proposals, many, I I would say forward-looking proposals. Uh, I would like to first to congratulate the WHO uh, uh, also for uh, what they have done. And um, um, I reread uh, once again recently the report that was prepared, um, uh, which was commissioned by uh, Dr. Tedros uh, on how to improve the response <coughs> uh, for to the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, uh, this report was led, uh, co-chaired by uh, Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand and former um, head of uh, UNDP, and also by another prominent uh, uh, leader, um, Alan Sirleaf Johnson, the former President um, uh, of uh, Liberia. And um, I, uh, with uh, plenty of very good uh, insight, very good uh, suggestions and proposals, so my fear is that uh, some of these proposals may slip uh, within the cracks, I would say, of uh, uh, the current system. Uh, what, what I believe uh, can be done and should be done, <clears throat> I think first uh, uh, the G20, which are emerging, uh, I, I think, as, a, as an important global player in many of these um, uh, areas, which was at the very beginning, they started uh, only by response to a financial crisis in, um, uh, in 2009. They're 
taking uh, an important lead in many of these areas. And these are the countries that have 90% of the global GDP. They have a particular responsibility uh, for many of these issues. I would like to see closer cooperation between the G20 and the United Nations. Uh, I would like uh, also uh, to see uh, uh, an effective United Nations. Maybe should reform. There are plenty of ideas, and uh, Antonio Guterres proposed, and many of the uh, other uh, United Nations leaders, no doubt that the system should be reformed in order to respond to uh, what is happening now. But I would like, and I think this is uh, very critical, to have a political um, uh, agreement, a new kind of a political contract uh, among the uh, the players and uh, the, the big players, as I said, you know, on something which is fundamental, the global public goods. They may not agree on all the issues, political issues in geopolitics nowadays in the world, but in view of the pandemics, they have indeed to agree on some fundamental public, uh, global public goods, like health and health security and fighting the COVID and overcome these nationalisms and vaccine nationalisms and others, uh, to agree that climate change, I think we are moving towards this, uh, that climate change once again uh, is this huge challenge for humanity, but also fighting it uh, is, is really critical for the survival uh, of the planet. And maybe look once again to revisit uh, the Sustainable Development Agenda 2015, because we know that it cannot be achieved uh, already five years, six years after its adoption, and to see where uh, indeed uh, uh, some of the um, uh, goals and others can be revisited to be a little bit more, more practical, but to join forces uh, and, to, and to see where the United Nations can play this indeed uh, critical role. So I, I believe there is, a, there is a space for cooperation uh, and uh, I would say there are ups and downs. Uh, we see that um, when uh, important um, uh, powers are pledging uh, to uh, reduce global emissions like last year and achieve uh, uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent even of uh, uh, these reductions uh, compared uh, to the um, um, 1990. Uh, uh, and this General Assembly session also just a few days ago, important um, once again announcements by President Biden uh, to uh, allocate more money uh, to uh, the uh, fund uh, to fight uh, uh, and help the developing countries uh, cope with this situation, or by President Xi Jinping saying that they're not going to finance more uh, projects uh, called developing projects. So I think there are good examples of uh, an approach that it can work, uh, and I think the positive there, the good things, have to be supported, promoted, encouraged, uh, so that indeed the United Nations can play its role. Okay, thank you very much, Irina. So how can the United Nations be even stronger? How can we uh, reinforce uh, multilateral actions? And I'm going to turn to Dr. Patty for the last comments before we go to the question and answers. By the way, if you have questions, please uh, send us uh, the questions. If you want to speak as well, that might be possible. So send us the questions um, as soon as possible. So Dr. Patty, we will stay on the, on the same question about how can we uh, strengthen the approach of One Health? How can we structure the multilateralism internationally so it's getting more effective? Over to you. Thank you. I'll be brief and just say two uh, things. One is that if you look over the last 20 years or even beyond that, what is happening now with COVID-19, the first zoonosis that has caused huge havoc in the world, we knew, and there are several reports that flagged it, but what was lacking was the will to act. Can you see me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, very good. That the, the political will to act is really what was lacking. And that manifested itself in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, several recommendations of panels after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa remained unfulfilled. And we're going back to the same recommendations now. So until the world and the world leaders really step up and the political will is mustered to act, to exercise that leadership, I fear that we might sort of just ease back into our normal ways of doing things and miss the opportunity of using this crisis as an important point 
to change the direction of how we think, even in the direction of the One Health, to prevent other uh, uh, threats that affect the human population. And secondly, I think this uh, this space is replete, what I may call a double speak in that sense, because the principles, nobody will disagree about multilateralism. But when it came to really uh, manifesting that and cooperating in that, that global consensus, I think, um, has to be reestablished and it requires a lot of work to do that. It's not necessarily a technical problem, primarily. I think it's really an adaptive problem for the world, uh, given where we're heading at this moment. All right, thank you very much. Um, so now we will move uh, to the question and answers part. Um, so I will do the questions, you're going to do the answers. <laughs> um, so maybe the first question that we've received is, um, and I guess that might be uh, more towards Dr. Yamamoto from WHO. Um, at the beginning, we mentioned the difference between uh, countries with more and less resources. Is it possible to think that countries with less resources are more prone to health crisis? Can we expect to find more zoonotic zones in countries with less resources or not necessarily? Uh, over to you, Dr. Yamamoto. That's the question. Mm, yes, uh, when we talk about uh, zoonotic diseases, zoonotic diseases, of course, this is uh, all people's issues. We cannot anticipate which area could be the uh, uh, triggers country, triggers area to the next pandemic. But still, the uh, some area like a low middle income country who has a, a weak health system and some more close linkage with the animal and the human, uh, and also uh, some uh, facing some challenges of food safety or wild animal trade. That area, we cannot say hot spot, but we should strengthen our monitoring system and support that countries as well. And when we talk about human resources as well, you know, we definitely we need to work together and strengthen our support that country in terms of the monitoring, in terms of prevention, in terms of early diagnostic and responses. Having said that, I would like to reiterate the SDG, the importance of SDG, including universal health coverage and the regular health system. Uh, we all country now working for it, but we would like to strengthen efforts. So, but to do so, we definitely we need uh, more resources and uh, uh, domestic resources and international resources to support each other. And also, we today we discuss a lot about access to medicine, access to vaccine, and so on. Again, solidarity mechanism uh, need to be created. So as uh, uh, so our Irina Sam said that uh, uh, we now discuss some international leader discussing about the uh, uh, global authority for the pandemic and responses. So uh, we would like to uh, see that and, and also encourage that kind of discussion. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yamamoto. So reinforcing on the political will um, and the political uh, interactions um, at through WHO level, Indeed, we do need more cooperation. And maybe another question that we will direct to both Melanie and Elise would be about the, the place of civil society in these discussions, because we've heard a lot about how governments have to interact um, to, to, to support the efforts. But um, Melanie, you mentioned earlier a little bit about civil society approach, research, etc. Um, could you develop a little more on what could a civil society do? Uh, what could us uh, at at our level, do uh, to participate to this uh, One Health approach. Absolutely. Um, so it's really important to consider civil society as much as an actor that can act on what the, let's say, the scientific knowledge can give them, but also as a creator of knowledge. So if I take a, a, an example that is a bit more precise, uh, when we talk about um, urbanization and the fact that in certain regions you will have more encounters between the, li the wildlife and the humans because of uh, certain development models, it's extremely important to consider that 
the population that are currently ongoing this uh, economic development should be included in every uh, policy aspect, but also in every scientific research that are being done uh, in this specific context, not just because it inter it's interesting to have them as data points, but also because they have a local knowledge about the situation and they actually know more than the scientists uh, about the local situation and about the wildlife uh, technically. And so it's extremely important to see now civil society, not just uh, in a, in a top down approach where the scientists could tell us what we should do, for example, but also uh, in a bottom up approach. And so really uh, seeing these population as sources of knowledge. And so if you think a little bit of the classic valorization uh, protocol uh, of research, you often have a partnership between an industrial uh, or a company and a research laboratory. Uh, and most often it's, it's, it's a public private partnership. It's very classic, very common. Uh, and that's how uh, valorization of research uh, works in the economic uh, development. Now, if you think of the social and environmental development, we could try to reframe this kind of partnership. And instead of just thinking uh, of a company working with a research institute, could we imagine uh, a civil society organization working with a research institute to create this kind of uh, environmental valorization of research? So it's really um, something that we have to create a framework for, a system for. It's not exactly in place today. There are some experiments that try to do that, uh, but it's really a more global and political question that we have to address. And this question is just, how do we want to think about science and what as a citizen uh, can I do uh, in, in a science project? What could be my role? And I'm talking about an active role, not just a passive and uh, a respondent role. All right, thank you very much, Melanie. And I will turn to uh, Elise for so the same question. Um, so Melanie told us about the, the need for a more bottom-up approach. We are putting, from what I've heard, uh, civil society in an expert position. Um, from your side at Global Health Advocates, um, can you give us some examples of how the civil society can be more involved in the One Health Approaches uh, discussions? Well, maybe just to mention that when we talk about civil society, you know, it depends on how you 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 envisage uh, the, the the concept. But you know, it can also include communities and people who are actually you know working in this field in the ground. So, uh, as uh, as Melanie said, there is a matter of also involving people who are actively you know involved in the response in the implementation of solution on the ground, but uh, through uh, you know. Uh, uh, social movements, as well as uh, frontline uh, health workers, if you if you take the, the, the field of, of health, and many, many, many ways to, to, to get, you know, um, uh, this uh, uh, citizen as, uh, you know, a, you know, a, an already uh, playing uh, actor in the in this field. So that's one way. And we have many, many um, settings where, unfortunately, the voice of civil society isn't uh, that recognize and uh, when it comes to uh, question uh, a public policy or a question the way uh, the decision are made uh, are made in a country you don't have this uh, this uh, this uh, this great recognition of the role of civil society just just to, to mention that and maybe um, another point on the world one health appro approach specifically is that I think this um, call for uh, a better integration in uh, uh, linking um, uh, the, 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 the field of environmental and health, for example, um, is also uh, important to take into account when looking at how civil society is organized. Uh, you have uh, at the moment a lot of global health um, uh, organization like mine, but also uh, many, many others, 
were not that you know involved in this discussion uh, uh, and not very well informed on these linkages with uh, uh, environmental issues. And at the same time, you have also some very powerful and very important uh, environmentalist organization who um, are very active and very important in this global debate around the climate change, for example, but sometimes not um, uh, looking at uh, the, the health aspects of uh, the, 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 the climate change uh, issues. And that's also, you know, maybe uh, a call for having maybe a better coordination and a greater collaboration between these two fields, even within the civil society, in order to amplify, again, you know, the voice for having a unified front and promoting this One Health approach. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to turn to Irina, who wants to add on that. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Audrey. Um, I, I really think it's an important uh, discussion, and definitely the civil society can play a role. Uh, I would uh, just want to say that when we speak about science, sometimes uh, we tend to think only about uh, natural sciences, exact sciences. We tend to forget about social and human sciences. And I think this is a critical, uh, uh, critical I would say, moment, uh, particularly with the pandemic, but also with the SDGs, with the climate and others, uh, uh, to look at the societal impact. And this is where also the civil society can play a role. Uh, because none of the uh, problems is purely technical nowadays, uh, be it the question with the vaccines, and we were speaking about inequalities, we were speaking about their impact on, on other, uh, uh, on human security, on other segments of society, inequalities and all this. And without a very strong, I would say, approach of the uh, social, of human sciences, of to understand what is happening in the, our societies, I don't believe we will find the right approaches. So that is why I just wanted to flag out that speaking about science, we speak also about social and human sciences, working together with the natural sciences, this integrated, not silos, but this integrated approach in order to find the right answers. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, I will keep the same question actually and ask it to uh, Dr. Patty. Um, how, because you've, you've uh, held some roles in, in very high international organizations, um, how do you see the role of civil society? What can we do more? I, I think the um, civil society has a very important role as a connector between the, the citizens, the states, but also the international system and the organizations that act within that. And they only have a uh, role, not only in terms of helping ask the right questions, but also keeping everyone honest uh, by holding actors to account. So this role that is uh, envisioned, and I think it's a great one, where the research questions, the scientific questions to be answered, are developed, uh, um, uh, uh, researched uh, to the extent that uh, civil society could play a role, but also disseminated in terms of translating that into the policy discussion in the countries and also monitoring the, 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 the actions of, of leaders of states or uh, international organization will be very important in terms of bringing uh, coherence because the issues that we're dealing with are not ones that are fragmented and there is no institution or department of government by itself that will solve this. Civil society provides a potential vehicle, a platform for that integration to happen in terms of the problems and the solutions uh, with scientific inputs uh, that are necessary. So I, I think that's an important uh, element that will help us emerge out of this pandemic and build a world that will be much more uh, better, more resilient than what we had before the pandemic that we're experiencing now. Thank you very much, Dr. Patty. And uh, building on what you just said um, about having civil society holding uh, institutions accountable. I am going to turn to Dr. Yamamoto about that. Um, there is this discussion about WHO governance reform. Um, what would, what, I mean, where would you see the, the place of civil society there? Accountability processes involved in the discussions? Um, I don't know, can you tell us a little bit more about what have been thought so far? Well, thank you very much. Uh, there are no question about the role of the importance role of the civil society and civil society organization. But the, honestly, the WHO also trying to still trying to find more more strong way 
strong way to how to work with the civil society. We have many dialogue, many civil society help with us to advocate and promote health and support community and so on. So how we create more cross-cutting institutionalized manner for it. But uh, let me add it one, another most important, um, another important role of the civil society for our organization is civil society brings small voice or silent voices to the, uh, on the discussion with the global arena and many other uh, places. And uh, civil society is a strong role to capture and bring the reality in the, uh, our discussion and also in terms of accountability and monitoring of the, our progress is a, the very important issues. But that should be done by a global level, regional level, as well as most importantly at the country level. So in a country level, country, government and civil societies and how UN agency can facilitate or uh, uh, work together for that direction. That's the most important issue, I think. And uh, I heard that uh, uh, Melanie or somebody has already mentioned that uh, there are many different uh, places to discuss different issues. Even in the global arena, we have a COP26 climate change, COP15, the biodiversity, nutrition food system summit, or small island developed countries, uh, head of state now discussing in New York about their uh, uh, burdens. So how we can mm, bring all the existing power and efforts to the same places together with the civil society. That is a way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yamamoto. Um, so maybe coming close to the end of the questions, um, what, maybe two more questions. Uh, one would be uh, to uh, you, Irina, because earlier you talked about revisiting the SDGs. Um, could you build up a little bit uh, on that? What would you change, revisit uh, in the SDGs right now? It's a tough question. Yes, it's a big question. Uh, actually, I don't want to be misunderstood. Um, when I said revisiting the agenda, it does not mean that I challenge the objectives. I think this is very important. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, this is a platform and objectives that stay uh, uh, because it has been, uh, it is uh, comprehensive, it's universal, um, it touches upon uh, all the uh, aspects of, uh, of, uh, of life and what we want to achieve, uh, uh, the uh, harmony with nature and protecting by diversity and human security uh, and good governance and institutions, uh, democracy, everything is there. I just uh, was thinking that um, definitely uh, the Secretary General also mentioned that we may be 20 years back. We are going to lose achievements uh, with the Millennium Development Goals uh, uh, and others. Um, I'm given an example with education, and it's really, uh, uh, I would say, uh, um, heartbreaking to see that uh, kids that have um, achieved some education, some levels, will not go back to school. We are seeing that uh, girls are particularly affected. It has been a, an effort by the United Nations to uh, make a more inclusive education uh, in girls. And, and uh, my fear is that it may be a lost generation for the future, because it it is not just a couple of months that they have missed, uh, but uh, uh, with inequalities and with the failing systems in some countries, with the austerity measures in the developed world, we are seeing that development budgets are shrinking, uh, uh, and this will affect definitely uh, the uh, achievement of the goals. What I think is necessary to be done is that against this background, to look at some of the targets uh, and to see whether uh, we need uh, uh, some more, I would say, shortcuts or specific efforts in order to achieve the targets and to focus on those countries which are indeed are lagging behind and to see what are the measures that have to be taken in terms of policy, in terms of investment, uh, in terms uh, sometimes of, uh, of some normative setting, uh, some priorities uh, in order to focus there where the need uh, is. 
Um, some, I think, uh, they may be in some cases catching up uh, with the, uh, what 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 has been. But definitely, in my view, uh, the agenda stays at the most ambitious agenda. The goals are there. We want to achieve them. We just have to uh, revisit and to look how are we going to achieve because the situation is quite different nowadays than it used to be two years ago. Uh, and as I said, there is uh, unfortunately setbacks in this process. Uh, um, uh, and uh, I just want last but not least to mention the impact on women. Uh, there has been in Paris uh, here the uh, uh, Generation Equality Forum. Before that in, uh, in Mexico there was a lot of talk and discussion about uh, the COVID and the impact on women. Uh, we didn't have this. We don't have it in the uh, goal number five uh, on gender equality. But we have to look it from the lens and the optics of this impact on co of COVID on some of these sustainable development goals. All right, well, this kind of answers my, that was the last question I had on the list, which was how a young person who is also maybe one of the, the most, uh, like the, the, one of the persons who actually had the most difficulties during this crisis, they didn't go to school, women are falling behind, how can a young girl, uh, for instance, what can, can a young girl do today uh, to, to help improving the development goals? But I think you've already touched upon this a little bit. Um, so I guess this would be the end of the question, and to, unless I have one last question, but it doesn't seem so. So I will suggest maybe a last uh, round of uh, the speakers, if you have some last words uh, to say uh, to the audience. And before we do that, I'd like to thank you all for participating. Um, so now I will uh, give the mic to Dr. Uh, Yamamoto for some last words. that we should bring, make our world more safer, healthier, fairer, and greener. And uh, we also uh, find out the, how equity issues, is inequity issues is deeply uh, and very important issue for us. So uh, we, we really appreciate this today's dialogue. Yes, one health is need to focus on the one area is need to prevent the next pandemic. What exactly we can do to the early detection area? But beyond that one, we discuss a lot about broader issues of the one health for the future for the greener and the safer health society. So I'm looking forward to work, continue to work with all of you in the global level, but as well as country level. Thank you very much for this dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yamamoto. Now moving to Dr. Patti for some last words. No, thank you. I think I'll just say that uh, we have one planet. Uh, we are one. I think our destiny is one. We're interconnected uh, with our environment, with all other uh, species that are also occupying this planet. So we have to act responsibly, uh, but we have to act. I, I think um, we cannot, no one will be safe. Uh, no country will do it alone. And the issue of the uh, wealthier or poorer, our fits are interlinked. And so we have to pay attention to those who have fallen behind and invest, support them, and, 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 and bring them up to par, whether it's in health, whether it's in the fallout from all the things that we've been speaking here in terms of zoonosis or in terms of the climate change uh, issues that are facing our world. So we are in it together. Thank you for this excellent panel. Thank you very much. Um, now turning to Melanie for some last words. Thank you very much. Um, it can be frightening time because we are seeing a lot of crises happening, um, but it's also a very interesting time because if you think of Zonos, it means that we have to rethink completely and reframe completely or interspecies link uh, with other animals, which is both a huge task, but also something that is uh, extremely rich and extremely interesting. And the fact that everyone can nowadays participate in this kind of discussion and should be part of the discussion uh, is also for me a, a source of hope. So I look forward to see how we all advance on this path. Thank you very much, Melanie. Now turning to Elise for some last words. 
Yeah, thank you. Well, I think with the crisis, we've seen a much divided world with a, a global uh, system that uh, didn't pass the test. I would say the governments um, have turned inwards towards national solutions rather than uh, putting uh, much more energy on a needed global cooperation. And I think that's, 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 that's the, the, the question and the challenge, you know, we cannot afford anymore having a profit driven decision making uh, process, a lack of solidarity when it comes to address such challenges. We need to, to stop feeding a system where this is a, every man for himself and be clear on the need to put more justice and meaning linking uh, human rights and development to achieve uh, better um, uh, goals in the in the area of uh, of the planetary health, and I hope that we will uh, manage to uh, to take and uh, to draw the lessons of the current pandemic in order to prepare for the next one by starting by fixing the issues now for the current one, um, and also prioritizing solutions that are equitable and fair because I really believe that uh, we need to uh, yeah to really put more on uh, the justice uh, challenge in order to address uh, the natural ones. Thank you very much, Elise. And now I'm going to turn to Irina for some last words. Well, I think a wonderful uh, conclusion uh, from all the panelists. Uh, what Dr. Patti said uh, reminds me of uh, something that uh, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, was mentioning many times, that we do not have planet B. Uh, we don't have uh, any other plan than saving this planet and uh, uh, also saving humanity. Uh, what I want to say uh, is that uh, this COVID-19 pandemic showed that we are one, one humanity. Uh, we have to show solidarity, empathy, justice. These are all words that, in my view, are carved and should be carved in the response uh, to the pandemic nowadays and to building Everybody says build back better, but what does it mean? I think it has to be solidarity, empathy, and justice. Okay, thank you very much. So how are we going to build a better world all together? This is all the theme of uh, this uh, Rencontre du Développement Durable. Um, so the panelists have already made a very good conclusion of this roundtable, so I'm not going to go uh, any further. Um, just maybe to let you know, because we're right on time, okay, two minutes late, but almost right on time. Um, but in 15 minutes, you will have another panel um, that will be at uh, the end of the day, and it's going to be on sustainable towns, uh, donc bâtir des villes durables pour un futur plus désirable. So we will uh, find you back in 15 minutes. On vous retrouve dans 15 minutes. Merci beaucoup à tous. Merci uh, aux orateurs. Thank you very much to as a panelist. <laughs>